Hey folks, good morning. This is Vance Hilderman here from Effusion and joining me is Jeff Stevenson. Jeff, can you hear okay as well? Uh, very good. So folks, today's webinar is about aviation development and certification efficiency. So let's begin. We've got a large number. Looks like this one was oversubscribed as well. And again, we're sorry, we only allow a thousand people on our web server, that's the server limit. So please tell your colleagues they can watch your video link, we'll send them the video link so they can watch this later. Let's begin. Again, Vance Hilderman from Effusion, we'll be here for about 45 to 50 minutes, and then we're gonna switch into Q&A mode. So if you can submit your questions, we'll do our very best to enable them all and get to all the questions, but if we don't, We'll do our best with email. This is number 11 in Effusion's Technical Aviation Training Seminar Series. We do these free to the world to hopefully make aviation safer. It's been an interesting time. You're seeing me not from the Effusion office, but this time from the home office. Probably many of you are working from the home office as well. It's all about safety. This seminar is about aviation development and certification efficiency. Remember, anyone can spend thousands of dollars on a custom made suit. It's much better to spend a fraction of that and get just the quality. Same thing's true with aviation. How do we do that efficiently? How do we do it smartly, cost effectively, and still be safe? That's the answer, okay? Well, let's take a look. Again, a couple seconds about Effusion. We are the world's largest pure aviation development certification certification company services. We have engineers working at any given time, normally in about 15 countries. Most of our engineers are grounded as you are. So we're gonna have an introduction. We're gonna talk about aviation, the big picture. It's an ecosystem, 178, 254, 4754, 4761, the alphabet soup of aviation safety and development. Then we're gonna talk about some specific aspects for certification cost and efficiency, things you need to get that custom made suit for a fraction of the price. And then we'll have time for questions and answers. And again, we're oversubscribed. I can see we've reached the limit. A dialogue box keeps popping up telling me we're over the limit. So sorry about that. You can share this with your colleagues. Let's start with a quiz to begin, okay? You know how these work. The quiz, famous quiz, true or false? 178, 254, 47, 54, 61 are mandatory for all aviation. True or false? They apply to most aircraft and avionics. Hmm, that's the same answer as number one, right? Surely. Safety assessments must be completed prior to aircraft and system development. Hmm. Engineering checklists and proof of reviews are optional and very helpful. What do you think about that one? Process and quality assurance, PA, QA. Those personnel are key performers of engineering technical reviews, true or false. A review of an engineering artifact is best performed by multiple reviewers. Hmm, how many of you have seen a document with five, 10, 12 signatures on it? Boy, that must have given you confidence. True or false? 50-50, better odds than Las Vegas. How do you do? Let's see. You will find out in 45 minutes. Now, a little bit about me. Again, Effusion, we're one of the world's largest aviation certification, mentoring, training, consulting companies. The fact you've logged on, you've probably heard of us. Our engineers normally are working worldwide. We're a little grounded lately, so we have time for these webinars. We have our own frameworks, checklists, templates for all phases of aviation aircraft development. We work with probably 90% of the world's top two or 300 aviation companies. They buy our checklists, our training, our engineers, processes, all of that stuff, and a little bit about me, but that's not why you're here. Let's go on with the technical content. Let's begin how to understand and apply improved development and certification efficiency. Now, we have a new ecosystem for you. It's continually expanding. The world is expanding, you know that. And in fact, astrophysicists have proven that not just the 
material world, but the fabric within the universe is expanding like bubble gum, like taffy, putty, it's expanding. It's the same with our aviation ecosystem. In your upper left, we have the 4761 safety guidelines, okay? Then we have 4754. Remember, 4761 and the new version 61A coming out this year says, what is, based on the functional hazard assessment, the criticality level, development assurance level, the Dow. Then, based on that, how much safety do we need? What is our architecture? What are the safety requirements? Then we feed to 4754A. That's the system development. So 61's the brain, 54A is the system. And then at the legs, hardware, software, we flow down using advisory circulars and technical standard orders. These have our framework requirements and our actual functional TSO, minimum operating performance requirements. The ecosystem then includes DO160, environmental testing, 178 software. All of these DOs, DO stands for document. In Europe, it's ED, European document, okay? This is the ecosystem. It must be applied top down and bottom up for closed loop. Now, let's consider the airworthiness period, pyramid. Many people forget that the interrelationship of this ecosystem is very tight. The previous slide, you remember that one, 61, 54, DOs, right? Top down, safety, systems, software, hardware, environment, ground, all of that. Now, we have to consider in parallel, how do we have parts manufacturing approval at the tip of the pyramid? Well, we get there from the bottom of the pyramid. Let's start there. The end goal is the top of the pyramid. It's true, PMA, approval to manufacture a part. But it begins down at the bottom. That's the type certificate, or TC as we say. When we have modifications, it's a supplemental type certificate. It's a big process. It's why our large airframe manufacturers, Airbus, Boeing, Embraer, Bombardier, Cessna, Gulfstream, they don't like to change very often. Your automobiles, they change every year. But aviation, we need a type certificate. When we have changes, if they're fundamental, if they potentially affect safety, they go through a very rigid process. Then we have the technical standard order, the TSO. Key systems have technical standard orders. Remember, it's minimum operational performance, not maximum. It's the bare minimum you must do to achieve certification. Then you cannot outsource to some random country, even Los Angeles, where I'm broadcasting right now. You have to have manufacturing approval from your certification authority for how you assemble, how you manufacture, how you train your people, how you have consistency. Because remember, once you manufacture, once you get certificate, then you're able to repeat that process. So do you have repeatable processes? So this and this is the top view of the airworthiness pyramid. Let's keep this in mind as we look at ways to improve the efficiency and the cost. It begins with safety. Now, we hate that question, who makes better aircraft, right? Bombardier, Embraer, Boeing, Airbus. What's the definition of better? Who makes a better car? Toyota Prius, Tesla, Ferrari, or Mercedes? It depends on your definition of better. Better is a subjective term. Safety is not subjective. So let's take a look at safety. This is an image reenactment of Tenerife. We know that one. Well, remember, part of the ecosystem, let's look at safety. Now, if I was flying an airplane, when do I relax? Well, right now here in Los Angeles, when we drive, it's very relaxing. We've got the virus times, there's nobody on the freeway. Well, we think we can relax. Usually when we're flying, it's like the Los Angeles freeway today, fairly empty up there. But in fact, 
you don't relax because let's look, all phases of flight from taxi, takeoff, initial climb, climb, cruise, descent, landing, all those have dead people. We can die anywhere. However, we spend the least amount of time in takeoff and climb, the most time in cruise. So cruise is the safest per minute, but even cruise isn't completely safe. You know crashes that happened, midair, turbulence, right? Air France, Brazil, tragedy. Well, our safety assessment has to consider all phases of flight. Remember, pilot workload is based upon phase of flight. So we consider all phases of flight because each phase is dangerous. We need proof that we've considered each phase of flight. What are the HMI, human machine interfaces, the pilot workload? How do they react? Now, we have a framework, remember? Oh yes, three slides ago, ARP 4754. That's the system aircraft, the implementation system, not the logic. Logic is in the circuit card complex electronics hardware, microprocessor, microcontroller, hardware, software. This is the system. We previously had an informal system, less formal really, called ARP 4754. The new system, ARP 4754A, incorporated lessons learned. It brought systems engineering and hardware software together. The idea was to improve development assurance level assignment. Is this a level A system, B, C, D? Is it level E? No impact on safety. Level D, minor flight crew can mitigate. Is it level C? Ooh, is it major? Could we have injuries, increased pilot workload? Is it level B? Could we have dead passengers, but not flight crew and major workload increase? Or level A, potentially a plane crash. So. We need to improve that process, number two. Then improve the integration with hardware software. No more separation of hardware, software, safety system engineers. Bring them together, prove, guilty until proven innocent. Prove you have a continuous feedback loop to improve that integration between system and software. Now, it starts with the safety assessment process. It's a three-step process really four steps let's look the functional hazard assessment at the beginning if this fails what happens in each phase of flight if it fails on taxi but fails on takeoff if it fails on cruise what are the actual implications okay so now let's take a look continue on after we have the FHA, we know what the contribution to failure is. So I know my level, level A, B, C, D. Is it called level? Criticality level, criticality. Design assurance level, development assurance level. Let's ask the CERT authorities, which term is preferred? Okay, they all are, they're the same. So they're interchangeable. Our documentation, unfortunately, potentially confuses us, all those words mean the same thing. You wanna be safe, call it the DAO. In some documents that's design assurance level, other it's development assurance level. The best term, the most recent is development assurance level, not just design, but development. So the PSSA, the preliminary system safety assessment, that tells us our architecture, how much redundancy, how much fault monitoring. You're sitting in a room right now, that has perhaps a smoke alarm, nitrous oxide detector, CO2 perhaps. It has a sprinkler system. Those aren't functional requirements. Those are safety requirements. The room you are in right now will function perfectly without those health monitoring and safety components. Well, you wouldn't feel safe. So the preliminary system safety assessment tells us how can we improve the architecture based on the DAO that came from the FHA? Then we feed back continually into the safety assessment. This answers one of the quiz questions, number three, right? It feeds back when we're nearing completion of design, 
we're finalizing the SSA, the system safety assessment, which is bottom up, top down, top down, bottom up, in aggregate together, it's a closed loop. Now, to summarize, FHA, functional hazard assessment, that comes from 4761 via 4754, head, body, identify the potential failures and their effects, then classify what's the severity of each of those. Then the preliminary aircraft safety assessment, analyze that proposed architecture, determine how are failures identified in the FHA? How do they occur? How can I mitigate, detect, prevent? These are my safety requirements. Then aircraft safety assessment at both the aircraft level, Boeing, Airbus, Bombardier, Northrop Grumman, eVTOL, okay? Evaluate the aircraft systems to determine are those safety requirements met? But there's a fourth item at the bottom, okay? It's continuous background, not sequential. It's the common cause analysis. If I have primary and backup, but put them in the same conduit, I have single point failure, one common cause. Do I have any common cause violators? Zonal safety assessment, geography. What's the physical location, okay? We'll look at these particular risk analysis. Then remember terminology. This is aviation English, avalish we say. Plans say what we're gonna do. Processes state how will you implement the plan. Checklists, in aviation, everything has a checklist. The pilot has a checklist. The co-pilot ensures the pilot follows the checklist. Independence, right? In aviation, everything has a checklist. Everything you do, safety, systems, hardware, software, requirements, design, implementation, verification, all of these have checklists, not just to ensure that you did it, but to help the people who follow know what process you use. So those checklists include very objective criteria, detailed, and we're gonna show you in a few minutes, 10 more minutes, a sample requirements checklist from a fusion. We'll actually walk through a couple pages of that. And then finally, PAQA, it's the same thing. Process assurance, quality assurance. At the low level software, it's quality assurance. At the hardware system safety level, it's process assurance. It's similar. We assess conformance of engineering. PA doesn't do reviews. QA doesn't do reviews. They do, but we don't call them reviews. They're called audits. Reviews are done by technical engineers, independent. If the level is A or B, people can die. So QAPA instead assesses conformance. Did you follow the process? Now, remember, 4754A is mandatory or an equivalent, but there is no equivalent. That's the trick. IEC 61508, IEEE, ISO 26262, QSM 882, 2167, 498. We have a lot of numbers, don't we? Those are not equivalent. They're a subset, okay, of 4754. 4754 is for the aircraft and the system. It comes first. We have eight topics, eight topics we must include. You can put them all in one plan, don't do that. That would be pretty foolish. But first, development. What are the process methods that you use for establishing the architecture, integration? How will you implement? Not the logic. Remember, software, hardware, logic. That's lower level, 178254. Then the safety. Safety plan. What's the scope of safety? Considering the aircraft, all the system integration, okay? MCAS system, TAWS system, pedo tubes, okay, yes, Airbus, Boeing. No one's perfect, but we learn from it, root cause analysis. How do we ensure that that safety process of 4754 via 4761 was actually performed and there's no gaps between different manufacturers, different systems? And then requirements management. How do you acquire, conceive, define the initial aircraft requirements, safety requirements, system requirements, system safety requirements, high level, low level, hardware, software. 
Then validation. Remember, verification. Does implementation meet requirements? Validation. Do you have the right requirements? Which is more important? Validation. If you don't have the right requirements, it doesn't matter that you verified them. So number four, what are the methods that you use to ensure the requirements and assumptions are correct? Write down that process, that's the plan. You're only as good as your weakest link. So to be efficient, make sure everyone follows the same minimum process and the minimum is actually the maximum. So you're compliant, but you're not done yet. There's five more, Pardon me, four more. Number five, implementation verification. After you validated the requirements, what are the processes and criteria you use to verify? For software verification, it's easy. Reviews, tests, and analysis. No inspection demonstration of software. Those are at the system. Then number six, configuration management. This cell phone, okay, is made by Apple. It's pretty good. Any good manufacturing company has good configuration management, but great configuration management means can you consistently manufacture, maintain that aircraft system, software, hardware for 30, not 29, not 31, 30 years after certification. That means someone different than the developers. We call it the B team. A team developments, B team maintains. Software hardware system is always being updated quite often for most systems. That means it's effective, we're evolving. So can those people who follow efficiently identify the same process that you follow? For every aircraft that's flying up there, do I know who wrote the requirements, who reviewed them, who tested? How can I recreate the same software, hardware, and system? Number seven, process assurance, also QA. What are the activities that ensure the developers followed the process and plans? QA, PA, they approve the plans. They audit the engineers and they keep records. They ensure manufacturing, repeatability, and suppliers. A series of links, there's no weak links. Finally, number eight, certification. How will certification be achieved? These are the topics that go in your eight plans, eight, for 4754. Now, after you have that safety assessment, FHA, PSSA, you've got the system development, 4754, we just finished that. Now we have software and hardware, but don't forget, we have a continuous feedback loop. Remember, we have to show truly that we follow the process. So everyone works together when we make changes we update system and safety, we reassess. Now, in all of aviation, we have three key processes. Let's don't forget, I wanna emphasize. Number one, planning. It's small, it's red, it's important. English, left to right. Then yellow, warning, the development process. Development follows planning. And then in the background, the integral processes, configuration management, QA, verification, validation, CM. Why is that green here? I made this chart many years ago, okay, for my engineers that I was training. It's green because that's the color. Remember, this is English I'm speaking, American English. Our British English friends, they speak the Queen's English. I speak American English. I'm American. In America, green is the color of American money. That's right. This green process in the background is the most expensive process. That's why I drew it green and big. We will, over the lifetime of your project, spend more money here than we will on the others. And we'll look at where we spend that money in five more minutes. Okay, so let's summarize QA. To be efficient, we want to minimize changes. If you drive from London to Paris under the channel, the underground channel, the tunnel, right? The most efficient is in a direct line. 
you can take a ferry across the sea, drive all over Europe, and then arrive in Paris. That's not efficient. It's a straight line, minimum amount of time. What is that? Well, for QA, it's number one, ensure that your project plans, standards, checklists, all comply with DOARP. Number two, assess the engineers, audit them early, starting with requirements, design code. Did they follow the plans, the standards, the checklists? Number three, keep records of number one and two, prove you did that. Now, remember, there's a difference between QA and engineers. QA doesn't write requirements design code. They don't review requirements design code, not technically, that's the engineering job. So engineers, they create and they verify. They do and review, okay? QA, on the other hand, doesn't. QA can participate, but the primary technical review comes from engineering with checklists. QA approves the plans. Only one signature truly is required on those plans and standards. QA doesn't write them. Maybe they write the QA plan. They approve them. By having QA approve the plans, it proves that QA has the knowledge of what's inside those plans. QA then audits the engineers and manages audit records. So as an example, you have a Dow B project. Dow B, passengers could die, not flight crew. What's the minimum number of people required for that project? Well, I'll give you a hint. There's four heads here, okay? Maybe you have a CVE, compliance certification engineer, a designated engineering representative here in the US, Canada. You also have a QAPA person and you have a creator and a verifier, four people total. So independence is really important. If we don't have independence, we have to redo it. So independence is about the, remember, integral correctness process, the big green expensive process we saw three slides ago. As criticality increases, independence increases. If we don't have independence, we have to redevelop. Now, criticality level could change. The system you're working on today could have a higher level in the future. If you reduce redundancy, if you increase flight crew workload, or you reduce the number of people involved with mitigating in flight, the criticality level increases. When that happens, if you didn't have independence, you have rework. So good recommendation. Even when independence is not required, do it anyway. It makes a better review and it's good insurance against future criticality level changes. Now, transition criteria. Let's talk about transitions. Transitions are the defined entry and exit for each process. Safety assessment. System, remember? Eight topics, ARP 4754. Software, hardware. We need to specify the transition criteria, entry and exit for each engineering process. Requirements, design, code, test. So, PA, QA, they're the ones who assess, did the engineers follow the right transition criteria? So define those transitions. PA doesn't do the transitions, engineering does the transitions. PA, QA, they assess. Remember, transition, it's the minimum data used to assess movement between safety, systems, requirements, high level, low level, design, implementation, testing. Now, if you had a waterfall lifecycle model, many of us use agile. Remember, if you're a hacker, that is not agile. Agile has a capital A, large A, it's formal, it's a process. We like agile, truly, not pure agile. Let's remember transition criteria, checklists, proof of reviews, you can make that work. But if you had a waterfall lifecycle model, the transitions are the arrows between phases. So for example, you're on a DO254 project. You're making hardware logic. It could be a complex set of AND or gates. It could be VHDL, ASIC, FPGA. 
there are six inputs required to that logic review. It's the same as a software code review. There's two outputs. If you have a review that does not have all six under CM, you have a practice review. Congratulations, you get to do it over. Don't do that, be efficient. Ensure that your first review is your last review if the requirements don't change. Remember, most of us should be making reusable components. Most of us are not working on all new systems. Most of us in the aviation business, all of you who've logged in, the great majority, are modifying previously developed systems. That means if you have unchanged components, they have the same requirements, design, code, test, reviews. If they don't change, you don't have to repeat these processes. You only need two things, retest it and review the test to prove nothing changed. Okay, now efficiency, let's continue. We are engineers. We don't like subjective things like, I love you, this tastes good. We live in the binary world, equations. We engineers love equations. This is my verification equation. V equals R plus T and a little a. Verification is, does implementation meet the requirements? We review everything you do, safety systems, requirements, design code tests. We test two things, the logic and the requirements. And then analysis is small, it's written small. Analysis is only used when the combination of reviews and test was not conclusive. Additional analysis is applied, no inspection demonstration for software. So what gets reviewed? Everything you aviation humans do. Plans, standards, requirements, design, code, logic, tests, results, traceability, top to bottom, bottom to top, if people can be injured. Problem reports, corrections, everything gets reviewed. Now, let's discuss checklists. Eight minutes ago, oh my, we are one minute behind schedule. You know what we call an aviation project one minute behind schedule, right? A big success. Let's continue our success. We said that we would review aviation engineering checklists. Well, checklists aren't provided by certification authorities. Transport Canada, EASA, FAA, CAC, all of the certification authorities. They have checklists. They won't give them to you. They don't want you designing to the checklist. So aviation checklists are generic throughout your project. You can reuse them. You slightly customize it for each project. They should contain all of your 47, 61, 54 requirements. 178, DO 200, DO 160, 254. It's your receipt, it's your proof of conformance. They're independently completed. They have to be for level A, B. You maintain those checklists in CM. You apply an update for each revision of each artifact and QAPA, they audit these checklists, okay? So remember, there's two kinds of checklists. Engineering checklists, did I meet the detailed standard and plan? They're technical. Then PA does audit sampling. Did the engineers follow the process, including transition criteria? Were all the entry inputs and outputs provably present and maintained 30 years later? So let's take a look at a sample requirements checklist, okay? This is one of Effusions. This is a system requirement checklist for ARP 4754. We don't have enough time to look at each line on eight pages, okay? So we're gonna look at a sample and extract of that. So our checklist at Effusion, we like to have a brief tutorial on first page. Hopefully everyone's been training. If they haven't, there's good books out there, good white papers you can Google. You might find my name out there. We summarize system requirements. So the system requirement checklist here, this is for 4754, it says, 
let's ensure system level requirements, including safety and derived requirements, are fully defined properly. There's a requirement standard and we comply with 5461. Then we've got some background information telling you a little bit about 4754 requirements. Again, the reviewer should review this summary, but the doer should really know what's going on before they develop so they can read this tutorial. Now let's look at the next slide. Let's refresh on requirements. At the aircraft and system level, we need safety requirements, derived requirements, and all the other requirements, functional, robustness, performance, environmental. So requirements capture, remember, that's one of the eight planning topics in your 4754. It's closely coupled with the architecture. Think of the building you're in right now. Look at that building. Ask yourself, do the requirements relate to that architecture? They do, so they're iterative. So requirements definition at the architecture and requirements capture are iterative. The architecture handles all requirements, then we're complete. So we start first with system level functions, considering the functional hazard assessment, and then we create the system design document that includes the system architecture. That was preceded at the aircraft, it's followed by the software hardware, okay? So now let's take a look at a sample of the checklist. This is, I think it looks like page three from a Fusion's requirement checklist. Number one, have all the applicable external environmental requirements been allocated to the system? Have you reviewed DO 160, remember, environmental testing? That was written, started before I was born in the 50s, literally before we had software 178254. Then, have all the applicable external performance requirements been allocated to the system? Do we comply with the technical standard orders? Remember half hour ago, the pyramid? Yeah, the bottom of the pyramid. Have potential failures and outputs of the FHA process been incorporated into safety related requirements? Are the system requirements consistent with the system level architecture? Iteration, remember? Then, do I have a description of how I've allocated requirements to hardware software, including safety related requirements and all potential failure conditions? I've got fault tree, I've got FHA, PSSA. Then, have all the fault conditions identified in that FHA, have they been addressed via the system requirements, okay? The safety requirements allocated to the system. Number G. Do the system requirements conform to the standard ARP 4754A and for safety requirements also 4761? Do the system requirements uh, deviate? And if they do deviate, is that deviation independently assessed before acceptance? And then there's seven more pages. Are the system requirements unambiguous? That means two different people have the same understanding of how to validate and verify that requirements. Are they consistent with the others? Are they complete? Meaning there's no undefined conditions. And I'm sorry to review the rest of this checklist. It's a long checklist, it's eight pages. We simply don't have the time, but you have the right idea. Everything at the safety system, hardware, software, requirements, design, code, reviews, tests, validation, verification, everything has a checklist. So now let's take a look. My goodness, we're back on time. Let's answer those quiz questions, okay? Number one, are 170C254, 4754A61 mandatory for all projects? Hmm, no, they're suggested. If you can use an equivalent, it's allowed. But remember, hard to find an equivalent, right? But technically. Now, do they apply 170, 254, 4754, 4761 to most aircraft? Yes, they do. Which ones? Not experimental aircraft. Here in the US, we have a lot of aircraft. We have a lot of space, liberal rules. 
So for uh, experimental aircraft, these don't apply. But for commercial aviation, military aviation, UAVs, UASs, for eVTOL, urban air mobility, oh, there's the Uber helicopter landing on my rooftop. They do apply, okay? So if you can show an equivalent, you don't have to, but there isn't one, so they really do apply. Number three, safety assessments must be completed prior to aircraft and system development. That's a wonderful idea and completely ridiculous. They can't be. Remember, it includes the bottom up. So the safety assessment can only be done near the end of the project because the safety assessment includes the SSA, system safety assessment, which says, did you build what you said you would in a safe fashion? Did you do your failure mode effect analysis? What's the result of that? Well, if you don't know the components, the design, how could you do the FHA? Okay, well, you can't. Oh my, I've got a little earthquake going on. My table's vibrating. That's a weird thing. No, I think just uh, I bumped my table. Sorry about my camera there vibrating. And number four, engineering checklists and proof of reviews are optional. Ah, uh, no, they're not. They're mandatory. Okay, you have to have them. Number five, process and QA personnel are key performers of engineering technical reviews. Absolutely not. Okay, remember. QAPA assesses the process. They approve the process, so they are the king, the queen of verifying that process. They can participate in reviews, but not as the primary reviewer. When QAPA does their job, and they do their job, that's called an audit. Number six, a review of an engineering artifact is best performed by multiple reviewers. Ooh. Difficult question. Many times we all have seen documents with three, five, 18. I was auditing a project, one of the Effusion clients three months ago. Their system requirement document had 18 reviewers, seven authors, 18 reviewers. Oh my. There were entire sections that were not well reviewed. And this is a popular company. You've heard this company's name. They're a good company. When we have multiple reviewers, human nature says, oh, John reviewed that, Mary reviewed that. Hmm. When there's one reviewer, we know it's me. I have to review them. So be careful. Now, if you have multiple reviewers, I personally like multiple reviewers, Make sure your review protocol, remember your process. Oh yeah, 40 minutes ago, process, plan, checklist. That's right. Your process says how you divide and allocate the scope of each reviewer. On the effusion checklists, we go one step further, actually two steps. We say, remember, one great reviewer is better than many good reviewers, okay? Well, on the effusion checklists, we ask one question. Who's the primary reviewer? It's like an orchestra. The orchestra has the leader, the conductor, and the different instruments, flute, trumpet, drums. The orchestra leader is responsible. I want to know who's responsible for the final review, ensuring that the other reviewers did their job. So a good efficiency improvement, do it this way. Have multiple reviewers, a chief reviewer, the head primary, and then review for adherence to requirements, adherence to safety, functional performance, robustness, okay? Boundary cases, conditions. That's the best way to go. Okay, folks, congratulations. You completed a 45 minute technical effusion webinar in 46 minutes, not bad, one minute behind schedule. So now we're gonna enter into our Q&A session. So many of you send us emails, we get 30 or 40 a day. Where can I get these free training videos? 
easy. You all have Google. I hope you do. <laughs> do a Google search, okay? YouTube of Fusion, you will find them. If you want additional information on aviation services, training, processes, mentoring, send us an email. There's a lot of information, technical information. I think with the latest website update we had uh, two months ago, we've doubled the number of pages on the Effusion site. So there's a lot of technical information there. Uh, our competitors will love that, I'm sure. <laughs> we see our stuff copied everywhere. Okay, folks, looks like you got some questions. What do we got? Oh, a lot of questions. Okay, let's take a look. Do we have to adhere to 4754A for development of an optical sensor on a gimbal for a fixed wing aircraft? Hmm, you know, it depends. It's a great question. It would depend on what that gimbal is being used for. An optical sensor, let's say it's a military aircraft and we're using it for targeting purposes, okay? In that case, probably not. It would probably be a DAL D, which is purely black box. Remember, good company like Apple is already gonna use DAL D equivalence processes. DAL D for software has 26 objectives, all external requirements, okay? Implementation, test of requirements, configuration management, the five plans. Well, however, if that optical gimbal is being used in a safety critical way, a fashion that would uh, affect safety. For example, I'm using that optical sensor to assess my uh, attitude. I could do it to assess uh, pitch, angle of attack, right? Um, I could use it for a lot of different things. Then it would be, if it's a backup, it's probably gonna be level C, Charlie. If it's uh, contributing to primary, it's gonna be level B. If it is the primary, it's level A with redundancy. So it depends on the application. For military, remember, in the back of the reconnaissance aircraft, let's say a uh, ASW, anti-submarine aircraft, a, a P-3, P-8, Poseidon, um, we have mission people. They are sending guidance to the pilot. Mr. Pilot, drop something here. Turn 20 degrees, starboard, ascend to 12,000 feet. Well. Those are pilot commands, they're safety related. However, the pilot does not follow them from a safety standpoint. The pilot has a type certificated or military approved aircraft. The navigation systems on that aircraft, those are safety critical. The mission systems in the back, including that optical sensor, those are not mission critical. So their suggestions, recommendations to the pilot, the pilot's not obligated to follow them. Mr. Pilot, fly through this mountain. Don't do that, okay? Use your primary flight management system, your navigation instruments to validate, assess, is this mission back of aircraft instruction uh, valid, okay? So I hope I answered that one for you. Let's see. What if FAA and DASA know what goes into the checklists? Why don't they simply provide them? They do have job aids. Ah, very good point. If we remember the old version of 178B, okay? 170B, early 90s, there was no checklist, no stage of involvement, no job aid, okay? Well, we entered into a realm where there was a lot of different suppliers. So FAA says, Federal Aviation Administration, US. Let's provide job aids. They're high level checklists for performing stage of involvements, okay? And the engineering activities. The concern was that people would use those as checklists. And guess what? They did. So people thought they could design just to the checklist. That's a big problem, okay? When you design just to the checklist, it becomes a minimum, not a maximum. So the FAA withdrew those job aids, took them down from the website. We still have them, we use them informally. We do like SOIs. Many of us have SSR, PDR, CDR, system spec review, preliminary design review, critical design review. However, those are subjective, okay? Instead, the SOIs are very objective. Stage of involvement, 
for them, okay? Number one, SOI one, are the plans and standards complete? Do they meet the regulations, guidelines? Are you ready to develop? Number two, your development's completed largely, at least 50%. Did you follow the plans and standards? SOI three, verification, validation. Does implementation meet requirements, design, code, integration, and the standards? SOI four, conformity review. What about the changes? Have we in, enabled all of those? Okay. Requirements management. You mentioned requirements management as a, a planning topic for the 4754A plans. That's right. Do you have to have a requirements management tool? No, you don't. You can use a napkin, pencil and paper. Don't use a pencil. It has to be ink and lock up the napkin. In re A little humor. In reality, if it's a small project, you can use Microsoft Word, Excel, but it's not efficient, okay? This webinar is about efficiency. Google requirements management tool. If you're a big provider, you know, uh, Boeing, Airbus, there might be a requirement for doors, IBM doors, right, compatibility. Well, doors is a big tool, expensive, not, not always easiest to use. There's other tools out there. We like JAMA, for example, for requirements management. It's a very good tool. You can also import, export, like, like many tools, two doors. But use an automated tool, whatever you use, buy one. It might look expensive, but in reality, it's really not. The cost of your time for untraced requirements, missed requirements, it's the changes. To be efficient, you want to minimize the changes, okay? That means have requirements right at the beginning. So the best way to do that is by requirements management using a tool. Okay, what time we got? Okay, I got time for one more question. Let's see. You did not discuss modeling in terms of efficiency. What can you tell us about modeling for efficiency? Hmm, good point. Oh boy, in the old days, we didn't use modeling because the modeling tools were pretty lame, pretty light, but it's about reusability. I think many good developers realize that most of their functionality is revisiting, reusing prior functionality. If you have a model, then you automate that development. So modeling is really efficient, okay? The thing to keep in mind is if you use modeling, you want to have a code generator that can automatically uh, generate the code. Tools like uh, No Magic Studio, uh, Rhapsody, SCADE, those are all good modeling tools. The modeling tool, if it's qualified, then you have some advantages for traceability, for verification of requirements, for automation, okay? And you don't need code reviews uh, if it's a qualified code generator. And there's only a couple of those in the world, okay? Three, actually. So on major full scale. But you don't need to have a qualified modeling tool. If you have modeling and we think at a fusion modeling is the future for efficiency, for productivity, the focus of this webinar. If you have a modeling tool, you have to follow DO331. Remember that early slide, slide four or five, we had the ecosystem DO331? That was modeling. So DO331 says you need two things, right? You need a specification modeling standard and a design model standard, because the spec model and the design model are not the same. They can exist in the same model, just like high level software requirements and low level software requirements can exist in the same requirements document, but they're not the same. First comes high level, then comes low level software requirements, transition, proof. Same thing with spec model, design model. The spec model covers the hardware software interfaces, the external system interfaces, external I.O., and it traces to the system and safety requirements. The design model contains the information for data flow, control flow, and internal interfaces. If you want more information, go to the Effusion website. There's a, a very good, well, I'm biased. I wrote it, but I had a couple of real good reviewers. There's a DO331 modeling white paper. Okay, folks, we've got, oh, man. 
with this hundreds of viewers, we've got 50 or 60 questions. I'm going to try to reply to all of you on your questions uh, with email uh, over a cup of coffee or another beverage of my choice this evening. Folks, thanks for tuning in. It's really been a pleasure. Be safe, keep your social distance, and we can make this planet a better place. Okay, less driving, less polluting. I've never seen the skies this blue in Los Angeles. Be safe. Till next time. Safe skies.